This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. A late breaking story still developing tonight, one that apparently involves the international drug trade and other strange happenings. Police and Texas and Mexico this evening confirmed reports of a mass grave containing 12 bodies near the Texas-Mexican border town of Matamoros. One of the bodies was that of Mark Kilroy, a 21-year-old University of Texas student who disappeared in Matamoros a month ago. Kilroy was on spring break from college with three friends. They said he left them as they were heading back toward the border bridge and they never saw him again. Kilroy's parents made several desperate trips to the area, handing out leaflets and pictures of their son, but they turned up no leads until the discovery of the mass grave today. Mexican police say they have arrested four suspects in the case. The police said that the suspects were drug smugglers who were involved in what is called some kind of voodoo practice. Except for Kilroy, none of the victims has been publicly identified, but there are indications tonight that other Americans may be among the victims. Now, we have a full report on this in the making, and we'll pass that along to you later in the broadcast. In Washington, more sparks at the Oliver North criminal trial today. North was peppered with new challenges to his attempt to portray himself as just following orders. Prosecutor John Kecker also posed new questions about whether North and or his operatives profited off of Iran-Contra wheeling and dealing. CBS News law correspondent Rita Braver reports on Kecker and North crossing swords on cross-examination. Today, Prosecutor John Kecker focused on convincing the jury that Oliver North is a master of, in Kecker's words, the 100% old-fashioned all-American lie. Kecker took North through a grueling account of the false answers he devised when Congressman Mike Barnes and Lee Hamilton wrote to the White House questioning North's Contra support activities. North admitted that some of the answers were deceptive, false, and misleading. Kecker asserted, in the U.S. Naval Academy, you would be kicked out for this. But North insisted, in the U.S. Naval Academy, nobody ever taught me about running a covert operation. And when North claimed that he was only following orders of his superiors, Kecker responded, at the end of World War II, German officers said, I know it's unlawful, but I was told to do it. You were trained that to say I was ordered to do it was not good enough. North, I don't believe I've ever received an unlawful order. Kecker pushed on. Didn't North have any moral qualms? North, the fact is, I don't think it was right, but I didn't think it was against the law. Judge Gerhard Gazelle wanted to know, did you at any time in this process consider in your own mind not doing it? Just saying, no, I won't do it. North, no, I did not. The prosecution also tried to show that North hid from the government word of the huge profits that North's friend, arms merchant Richard Secord, was making from the Iran-Contra initiative. Kicker charging that North was using his good offices to get the CIA to rent this ship from Secord for a secret mission, giving Secord as much as half a million dollars in profits. Kecker. You agree with me that General Secord is a patriot at a very comfortable salary. North, I agree he was a patriot. Kecker, at a very comfortable salary. North, those were your words. And Kecker forced North to admit that he had several nicknames for the CIA. One was fools. The other, North said, was not a word I'd like to use in the company of ladies. Rita Braver, CBS News at the Federal Courthouse in Washington. The Cincinnati Reds have won four games and lost two this young baseball season. That's good enough to put them on top of the National League West. It's also a lot better than their manager, Pete Rose, is doing off the field. Just about every day brings stories of new accusations claiming to link Rose with gambling on baseball. But nothing official, nothing on the record. Frank Courier has been investigating the latest accusations and reasons for the law's delay. CBS News has confirmed tonight through several sources that former friends of Pete Rose have told baseball investigators how they placed bets on baseball games for the Cincinnati Reds manager, including, some say, bets on his own club. The sources insist on anonymity, so in Houston, on his first road trip of the season, Pete Rose is the only one talking on camera and playing ball, he says, with investigators. Uh, I did a lot of small things, cooperating with, uh, with everybody. I mean, uh, you know, tax records and uh, checking accounts and that kind of stuff. The whole ball of wax. We, we, we're not trying to hide nothing. The sources confirm for CBS News that Rose phoned in bets through bodybuilder Paul Jensen, a government informant serving time for tax fraud. 
Other Rose bets, sources say, were made by Tommy Giosa, a former friend indicted for drug trafficking and tax evasion. The wagers, they say, were usually placed through bookmaker saloon keeper Ron Peters, who's awaiting sentencing on drug and tax charges. As the investigative net widens, Rose has distanced himself from Jansen, Giosa, and Peters, who are all now negotiating with federal investigators for reduced sentences in exchange for information about Rose's gambling habits. You guys got to realize I used to work out three times, four times a week at Gold's Gym on a regular basis. And those guys all worked out there, too. They were my friends working out. They helped me work out. That's as far as it goes. CBS News has learned that Major League Baseball was told Rose bet up to $16,000 a day on the game in the spring of 87 and bet regularly on the Reds to win. Rose denies it, saying his turn to talk with Chief Investigator John Dowd is still to come. I obviously going to have a time to sit down with Mr. Dowd and talk to him. I would think he'd want to sit down and talk to me. So he's not getting the whole story? He hasn't got my story yet. If investigators can prove Rose bet on the Reds, he could be banned from baseball for life. But testimony from convicted felons must be substantiated by credible witnesses or documents. And that, sources say, is the reason this gambling probe is now into its seventh week, with no end or verdict in sight. Frank Courier, CBS News, Houston. First Lady Barbara Bush will enter Walter Reed Army Medical Center tomorrow. She is to be treated with radioactive iodine, what's described as a standard treatment to try to correct a thyroid gland problem called Graves' disease. The medication she's been taking the past three weeks to try to block excessive production of hormones from her thyroid hasn't worked. The thyroid condition has caused Mrs. Bush to lose weight and produce some eye irritation. Now still to come on tonight's CBS Evening News, correspondent Bruce Morton on young people and what to do to get the plague of drugs off our streets. For weather in Alaskan waters, today spurred renewed efforts to clean up the Exxon mess, the nation's worst oil spill, but additional areas are now threatened by the gooey mass. More than 10 million gallons of oil gushed from the supertanker Exxon Valdez when it hit a well-marked reef last month. And as the oil slick spreads, there are growing indications of a backlash against Exxon. James Hattori begins our coverage. A break in the weather let Exxon send workers back to the gooey shores of Naked Island, one of the few areas where cleanup has begun. The work is painstaking, rock by rock, handful by handful of thick, sticky oil. There's no doubt in my mind that the long-term environmental consequences of the Prince William Sound oil spill will far exceed those of Chernobyl or Bhopal. Overnight, high winds and seas collapsed a barrier encircling the tanker Exxon Valdez. More oil sheens surround the ship, still under repair in Prince William Sound. The storm also took out two booms protecting the Sawmill Bay salmon hatchery, but a third stopped the oil from poisoning fish pens. Fishermen call it a near disaster. For the first time, oil washed ashore at Kenai Fjords National Park. Coast Guard cutters and fishing boats have stepped up, booming and skimming. While the storms let up a little, officials are bracing for wind shifts, which could send oil back toward shore. Often, when you have that calm, it'll be followed by a southeastern, and that is what we fear. Piles grow higher each day on boats collecting casualties. It hasn't really hit me yet. I'm not seeing dead animals, I'm just seeing plastic bags. Well, come on up to the morgue later. This is the scene of the grisliest work of all. Biologist Cal Lensing used to count the living in Prince William Sound. Now he counts the dead. You're not numb to it, but you can't let uh, your emotions run away with you either on something like this, or you couldn't do the job. Exxon has enlisted the Russians to help with this disaster. A Soviet oil skimmer, the Ve Dagursky, possibly the world's biggest, could arrive here as soon as this weekend. James Hattori, CBS News, Valdez, Alaska. Exxon's corporate image, like the waters and beaches of Prince William Sound, seems to worsen by the day. An image reflected in oil slicks, gas price hikes since the spill, and coast-to-coast -coast consumer frustration. I think it's a ripoff from the gas companies to the public. I used to buy a super on later, but now I have to buy the cheapest one. We shall cease all business with the Exxon Oil Company. As they did with the congressional pay raise issue, radio talk show hosts nationwide are talking protest, and listeners are responding. Here is my Exxon card and Exxon travel club token. Stick them up your oil spill. 
A marine biologist from Florida returned his credit card to Exxon in an oil-filled bag. The bumper stickers in Seattle urge boycott. The T-shirt of the day in Valdez proclaims, we're Exxon, we don't have to care. Some politicians say the company's official attitude isn't much better. It shows, I think, an extraordinary level of uh, callousness and disregard and incompetence on the part of Exxon. Analysts say the cost of gas was on the rise well before Exxon's ship ran aground, that the disaster created panic in the marketplace more than anything else. But some Exxon dealers already grumbling about the company's pricing practices say the disaster is spilling over on them. I'm proud to be a part of Exxon, but I'm just not proud of what's happening right now. I can't say I'm proud to be an Exxon dealer right now. Exxon said today its officials were too busy dealing with the disaster to comment on consumer boycotts or corporate image. And Coast Guard officials now directing the cleanup effort said there's no sense looking for a scapegoat. I think Exxon's trying to be a good corporate ci citizen. It's very difficult when you're the perpetrator to correct that image. An image that needs as much work as the waters and beaches of Prince William Sound. Jerry Bowen, CBS News, Los Angeles. Much of beautiful Miami didn't look much like Miami today. Thick, acrid smoke from brush fires in the Everglades wetlands rolled over the city, forcing evacuations from an alien detention camp and warnings to people with breathing problems. National Guard helicopters dropped water into high-intensity fire areas. Brush fires are normal this time of year in Florida, but the unusually dry winter is posing particular problems for firefighters this time. One tourist said, I came here for sun and I got smoke. Figure that out. We're now ready with a follow-up story on our lead report of the night, the discovery of that mass grave near the Mexican border town of Matamoros. One of the victims, a missing American college student who disappeared a month ago during spring break. Bob McNamara is covering this bizarre story. Authorities announced the grim discovery late today in Brownsville, just miles across the border from the Mexican ranch where the mass grave was found. One of the dead, a missing University of Texas student. Uh, there may be other bodies. Uh, there may be uh, uh, questions about how many are Americans. It was the search for 21-year-old Texas medical student Mark Kilroy that led authorities to the mass grave. And though Kilroy's parents had assisted police for weeks in a desperate search for their missing son, the investigation had come up with few clues until today's startling discovery, what could be the work of a satanic cult. They would have their sacrifice so the police would not arrest them, so bullets would not kill them, and they could make more money. Authorities say because many of the victims were severely mutilated, forensics experts may be needed to determine the identities and the nationalities of all the dead. Bob McNamara, CBS News, Brownsville, Texas. First major veto battle on legislation shaping up tonight between President Bush and Democrats in Congress. The Senate has approved increasing the federal minimum wage from $3.35 an hour to $4.55 an hour, what would be the first increase in the minimum wage in eight years. President Bush has vowed to veto any increase above $4.25. people for violating a curfew and a Kremlin spokesman said the police were temporarily seizing hunting rifles from thousands of Georgian citizens. Decide who will 